Well, as you already know, today is Father's Day, and as the Grove Church family gathers today on worship, I just want to give a special shout out to all the dads and also to the men in general. You know, I'm so thankful that as a church family, we can gather together, we can worship the Lord Jesus Christ, but also we can have an opportunity to encourage one another. And in particular, I just want to give thanksgiving for our men's ministry. Thank you men for being men who, who like iron sharpens iron, come together, have Bible study, have fellowship. And I just want to give an invitation to the fathers, to the sons, to the men in our community, even in our own church family. If you have been joined in with what God's doing in this church family, I tell you what, take a look. Now's the time for you to plug in. Well, on this particular Father's Day, we're gonna be blessed to hear from Gordon Ford as he's gonna be sharing God's word with us now. And I just wanna pray for Brother Gordon and for our church family, and thank you for being a part of the worship today. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity we've been having today to worship you. On this Father's Day, Lord, I just give thanksgiving to you that even as an imperfect father, I know that I have a perfect heavenly father. And I pray for each and every person that's a part of this time of worship today, that they would know that they can look to you, Lord God Almighty, as their perfect father. Lord, I pray for the men of this church. In particular, I pray for the fathers that you will encourage our hearts today. Thank you for Brother Gordon as he brings the word. He's a father himself, but God, he knows you, the eternal heavenly father. And God, I pray today our hearts and souls will be encouraged as he opens God's word with us and as we study the scriptures together. So Lord God, thank you for this day. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, I pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love for us. And we ask this in the mighty name of Christ, amen. Put your hands together and let's welcome Brother Gordon Ford as he gets ready to share God's word with us today. Well, happy Father's Day. Glad to be in the house of the Lord today. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Yeah. Amen. All right. All right. If you have your Bible, let's turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'll be reading verses 1 to 8. John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. Uh, Leanne and I were serving in the country of Botswana. And uh, backside of the Kalahari Desert, about 210 miles from the nearest paved road. From there to the nearest city was about another 150 miles uh, so it was an isolated place, and one Christmas, Leanne and I were having uh, a Christmas party for our pastors from the churches in our area, and we'd invited them to our house, and uh, they came in, and one of our pastors, uh, Pastor Michael and Taba, we had decorated a Christmas tree, and um, there's a funny story about how this Christmas tree came into being. Uh, I had assured Leanne that when we went to Africa, we would have no problem finding a live Christmas tree. And, uh, and uh, she was going to you know, get an artificial just to make sure. But I said, no, 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 don't put that in the crate. We don't need that. Well, we get to, to my own Botswana, and how many live Christmas trees do you think there were in the Kalahari Desert? <laughs> Not one. And so I was in deep trouble. I went out and I found an evergreen tree called a mapani tree. I cut it down and, and put it, uh, took it to the house and set it up as our Christmas tree. Unbeknownst to me, the mapani tree is a desert tree. It has butterfly leaves. And uh, when, it, when, it, when it feels threatened, the leaves close to cut down on loss of moisture. So it's a moisture retention and then if no moisture arrives, they just fall off the tree. <laughs> so within like, within like a couple of hours, there was just a tree with no leaves on it. And so the only tree in the desert that had any leaves that would stay on was a thorn tree. So that was our first Christmas tree. Well, we, we fixed that problem the next year. Uh, we had some missionaries going back to the States, and so we got their artificial tree, and we had decorated it. We put all these beautiful, shiny balls on that tree, and it was looking really pretty for Christmas, and our African pastors came. And I hadn't thought about the fact that these men had never seen a decorated Christmas tree. I mean, out in the Kalahari and in their tradition, they didn't have that tradition of Christmas. So Pastor Michael and Taba, when he came through the door and he saw the tree in the corner of our living room, he looked at it and said, oh, look, you've put fruits on the tree. All those Christmas balls hanging there sparkling and shiny. In his mind, that looked like a tree with fruits on it. 
I've never forgotten that. And that, that, that picture in my mind when I thought about it today with this text, I said, that's exactly what this text is describing for us. We're to be like a great branch decorated with good works, with good deeds, with good fruits. Because this is what the vine dresser in John chapter 15 is looking for. So if you have your Bible, let's look at John chapter 15, and here is the text. I'm reading out of ESV. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just to get the context of this teaching, I want you to see a picture. I took this picture from the Mount of Olives. Leanne and I were visiting uh, Israel, had gone up the Mount of Olives looking back down at the Golden Gate and behind it, the Temple Mount. Uh, in front of that gate, as you can see, it's been walled up. And uh, as I was looking across the Kidron Valley to that gate, I thought about the context of this chapter of Scripture. About six chapters in John are given in the context of the Lord's Supper, the last supper that Jesus has with his disciples. And he has been talking to them about the things that are important for them to remember. And this is critically important to the context of this teaching. When Jesus was thinking about what he wanted his disciples to remember and to be taught, he gave this teaching somewhere between the upper room, and then he would leave with his disciples, go out the gate, and go up the Kidron Valley, cross it, and then go up to the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus would literally exsanguinate as he prayed. He would literally shed drops of blood for the intensity of the prayer that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane when before the throne room of heaven, he knew he was headed to Calvary, where he would be the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Jesus going to Calvary has this teaching in his mind. That's why it's so critical. The last things that he was thinking about wanting to teach his disciples before he went into the garden, from the garden he would go to his judgment, and from his judgment he would carry the cross, later to be uh, relieved of it because he couldn't carry it any longer. He was beaten down uh, by the whips on his back, the thorns on his, uh, on his brow. He had been uh, pummeled in his face. His beard has been ripped out. And Jesus goes up to the cross to die on that cross for us. And before he gets there, he wants us to know something 
I'm stressing that point because I want us to realize how critical this teaching was in its context. So here's the phases that we see him describe in this text. He's talking about a vineyard. If you go to Israel today, in fact, going out of the wall, the city gate there in Jerusalem, Leanne and I walked around a wall, and there was a trellis, a large trellis over a porch that had grapevines growing on it. You know that the grapevine was, in the Old Testament, a symbol of the tribe of Israel. In fact, uh, it was carved into Solomon's temple on the front. So sometimes this grapevine has been a symbol of the nation of Israel. But in addition to that, Jesus is thinking about you and he's thinking about me as he walks into this, this garden and as he's looking at this vineyard. And so Jesus, as a master teacher, takes this picture and then he applies it into our lives personally. So here's what he says. He says, the vine dresser, who is his father, he looks at a branch and he says, this branch doesn't have any fruit. Next, uh, you'll show that next slide. And then he says in verse two again, there's a branch that has no fruit. But then he says, here's a branch and and there is some fruit on this branch. And then he says, if there's some fruit, the vine dresser will take an action on that branch in order for it to produce more fruit. So here you have no fruit, some fruit, more fruit. And then he concludes his teaching by saying to us, you know, if you would really love for God to be greatly glorified through your life, if you want to, to please God with your life, if he has invested potential into your life, then your gift to God is what you do with what he's invested in your life, your abilities, your skills, your gifts, your service to his kingdom. He says, if you want your father who created you to be highly honored, then he said, bear much fruit. Now, let's take a look at these conditions in the garden. In the scripture, there are two types of fruit. Number one, in Galatians, we find the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, meekness, self-control. And he says, against these, there's no law. So we know as followers of Jesus, when you put your faith and trust in him, the Holy Spirit came to live in you, and you were baptized into the body of Christ, and you became a child of God. And the Holy Spirit in us, when he is in charge, when he is filling us, when we're being led by him, when we are being filled with him, when, uh, when he, he is uh, directing our steps, the, the Spirit is free in us to produce fruit, the quality of his fruit in us. But there's also a sense in which the fruit that God is talking about here are good works. In fact, in two different places in the scripture, Ephesians 2.10, it says, uh, we are his workmanship, why? So that we may produce good works. Uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men that what? That they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, you know, because we have in our doctrine and teaching that good works don't save us, we are very careful not to let that uh, teaching be confusing to us because we don't want to be misunderstood. I don't want to do good works in order to get salvation. That's very clear in Scripture. Our good deeds will not earn salvation for us. There's nothing I can do to earn salvation. My good works will not earn my salvation. There's some who would believe that your good works and your sins are going to be put in a scale. 
If your good works are here and your sins are here, as long as your good works outweigh your sin, you can be saved. But if your good deeds don't outweigh your sin, then you will go to hell. The only problem with that teaching is you never know until you get into eternity whether you've been good enough. And unfortunately, or fortunately for us, the Scripture doesn't teach that. I'm not saved by my good works. But friends, the fact that I'm not saved by my good works should not prevent me from doing good works. When the Spirit is at work in us, He says you're His workmanship, and He has a life of good works that He's already prepared for us to walk in. Let me use an illustration. If I was uh, out in the parking lot and happened to have a flat tire, You left church. You saw me over there sweating, trying to change that tire. And you just came up and said, well, Brother Gordon, good luck. Hope you have. (laughs) Uh, I'm headed to, you know, get me some fried chicken for lunch today and hope you get that taken care of. What would be be something that would be most helpful there? (laughs) I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? Wouldn't you want to stop and say, is there anything I can do to help you? Now, you know, when it comes to mechanic, and I tell people I'm a do-it-yourself mechanic. If you have a problem with mechanics under your hood, uh, I say do it yourself because I have no idea. (laughs) But that doesn't mean that there's not some way that I can help. Uh, We we were at a a conference one time, and uh, two of the attendees had invited me to join them at a Chick-fil-A in the evening for, for a meal before he went to the conference. One of these ladies worked in Brazil uh, with gangs, and she's this petite little, about five two, five three inches, and she was probably 55, 56 years old, and this petite little single woman would go out into the streets of Brazil, into the gang areas, to work with these hardcore criminal gang members. And so she wanted to, in her testimony, she had some nunchucks, she had some knives. Uh, She was going to share, you know, about what she dealt with. So uh, when we got to the Chick-fil-A, there was a car that was broken down and had a flat tire. So me and the guy, we get out and we go over there and check what the problem is, and that tire couldn't be fixed. So we said, well, look, let us get you in our car, and uh, we'll drive you to a a, a shop, and we'll, we'll get a tire for you. So the man said, I'll stay here with the car and told his wife, you go with these two gentlemen. So he, she comes to the car to get in the back seat where the nunchucks and the knives and the gang paraphernalia are laid out on the seat while he and I are getting in the front. And, and he and I didn't think anything about it until she opens the door to climb in. And she looks as like... Who are you people? (laughs) Well, that scared her to death a little bit. But we were trying to do something good for her, and it worked out great. We were able to go explain to her who this lady was. We were able to share a testimony with her. But what is the good work that God has for you to do today? And as you're walking in His Spirit, being led by His Spirit, He is at work all around us. This last weekend, I was in uh, Indianapolis at the Southern Baptist Convention. On Wednesday afternoon, I was catching a ride to the airport. I took a lift ride. When I got into the car, I was by myself going to catch a late afternoon flight. And uh, the the driver introduced himself, Michel Angelo. So so when I got in the car, he found out from Venezuela about three years ago, arrived in the States. Uh, he's working there in Indianapolis. And uh, as I'm, I said, Miguel Angelo, I said, is that, is that Michael Angel? And he said, yes. He's still working on his English. I said, are you a good angel or a bad angel? <laughs> he said, oh, no, no, no. I'm a good angel. Oh, you are. As we begin to talk, he, he said to me, uh, before I came to America, I was in deep trouble, and I was contemplating suicide. And then I heard the gospel, and it changed my life. 
And I'm telling you, from the, from the conference center to the airport, we had this incredible conversation together. His, uh, he would, when he run out of an, the English words that he knew, he would speak Spanish into his phone, get it translated, hand it to me so that I could read it. And back and forth, we went all the way to the airport. And uh, he said, if ever you come to Indianapolis, you don't need to go anywhere else. You don't need to stay anywhere else. You come to my house. My family is your family. Anything you need, you can have. And what had God done? He had orchestrated a meeting. And you see, friends, he's doing that every single day in your life. Two weeks ago, I was preaching in First Baptist Church, Charleston, South Carolina. African-American man in the back, beautiful uh, suit, handsome, next to him, beautiful lady. Uh, after church, he was waiting with his wife on the porch. I went outside and uh, struck up a conversation. Guess who this was? The pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church, who, whose wife was one of the Emmanuel Nine who was shot in a Bible study. His wife was the Bible study teacher. This young white guy walked into the door of the church as they were having their Bible study. She, wanting him to feel comfortable, said, just come and sit by me made room for him to sit next to her. She was the first one that he shot. The pastor went to the court, and he had some things he wanted to say to that young man. And he said, when I got up to speak, I just felt the power of God come on my life. And I looked at the young man, and I said, I forgive you. Whether you accept my forgiveness or not is immaterial to me. And whatever you do and wherever you go in your life, you'll know there's one man who's forgiven you and the thing you need is to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Unbeknownst to him, the nation of China had decided this was too good to be true. Black man's wife killed by a radical white guy, and this is going to be televised in America. Let's just stream this without censoring it all over China so our Chinese people can see how bad America is. And they did that. Unbeknownst to them, a pastor was about to stand up and the Spirit of God was about to come on him and he was about to forgive this young man on live television that was streamed all over China in every home that saw it. And unbeknownst to that government, the next day, some Chinese uh, neighbors to some of our personnel walk over and say, we know you're from Charleston, South Carolina. Can you explain to us what this thing, Grace, is about. Friends, God is at work <laughs> all around you. Pastor recently met a lady, fell in love, got married, and are now uh, active back in church again in a great relationship with the pastor of First Baptist Church of Charleston. So friends, today, God is at work in his vineyard. And the principles at work in this vineyard, first of all, you see in the text, he says, there's a branch that doesn't have any fruit on it. What is the action of the vine dresser to a branch for which there is no fruitfulness? And in this text, this word eru in the Greek has two different uh, meanings. One is to take away or to cut away. It's emphasizing the direction. About 40 times in the New Testament, the same word is, is uh, interpreted to lift up or to gather up. When Jesus told the lame man, take up your bed and walk, the action of the direction of lifting the bed is this word. A friend of mine who studied uh, viticulture at university, I was asking him about what does a vine dresser do if he's working in the vineyard and here's a branch 
and it's, there's no fruit there. He says, well, Gordon, there's several reasons why a branch might not have fruit. He said, sometimes it falls off the trellis. Would you show the next slide? He said, sometimes it falls off the trellis. You'll see here that the trunk of this vine, it'll grow about 40 inches, depending on what you want to produce from your vineyard, what grapes you want to produce. It'll go from 40 inches to about five feet. And so he said, uh, when, the, when the branch is affixed to the trellis to hold it up, he said, sometimes a branch will fall off the trellis. And he said, when it does, the rain comes, or if it's being irrigated, he said, it'll stick to the ground, the mud will hold it down, it becomes sick, and it won't produce fruit. So I said, well, then what do you do? He said, oh, he said, every vine dresser carries uh, a jug uh, or a can of liquid on his belt. And what he does is he gingerly picks up that branch and he washes and cleans it off and then he gently puts it back on the trellis. And I said, why do you do that? He said, because the fruit-bearing branch is too valuable to leave it in that condition. In our lives as believers... We can get stuck and not bear fruit. Why? There's only one thing that clogs and makes this branch sick. And that's when I have unconfessed sin in my life. In the scripture, there's two kinds of sin that get us in trouble. One is... God has shown me to do something, and I refuse to do it. The Scripture says, to him who knows to do right and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. That is a sin of omission. In other words, God has given us instruction or given you direction. He's shown you something that he wants you to do for whatever reason. You said, I'll do it tomorrow, or you say, I'll do it later, or you say, this is not a good time for me, and, and you disobey God and that is a sin of omission. You remember Jonah? That was a sin of omission. And friends, our adversary will always provide us a ship to sail away from the will of God. And you know what that'll do to your branch? It'll make it sick. But not only is the sin of omission there, but it's the sin of commission. There's things that God has made clear, I don't want you to do this. I, th 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 that his word makes clear our disobedience to him. And when I disobey God in action, thought, or deed, and I leave that unconfessed, undealt with, it begins to clog this vine, and it begins to choke out the fruit of the, of the Spirit and the fruit of good works in my life. Most believers find themselves in this mixture. One day good, one day bad. One day good or one moment good, one moment bad. We go through these patterns. The problem comes when God deals with something in your life and you get rebellious and you refuse to change. Then the fruit begins to be choked from your life. It's like something that happened in our village in Maun. We were in the desert, as I said, and uh, we had a river that ran in front of our house that was uh, determined by the rainfall in Angola. And if they got good rains, the river would flow. If there wasn't much rain, the river didn't flow. Well, in that river lived a bunch of frogs. And I used to wonder, where do those frogs go when there's no water in the river? And I found out what they do. The frog burrows down into the mud. And as the, the dirt over his head dries, he just keeps going down until there's a crust between him and the air above. And so he just stays in this little frog cocoon down here waiting. And then maybe there's good rains, the river flows, and it begins to flow down the riverbed, and the water begins, the moisture begins to make its way down through that crust, and then the water hits that frog on his head. And now he knows 
The river's here. And he comes crawling out of his hole. Now, can you imagine being an extrovert frog buried in a little cocoon for like 10 months? So when he comes out, he's just so excited to see his friends. And he just starts croaking to his heart's content. The problem is my house is about 30 yards from that river, and I can't sleep. Not only is he yelling at all his buddies, but he's starving to death. Behind our house was a security light. That security light attracted insects, and Mr. Frog comes jumping out of the river back behind my house and stands under that light and eats all those insects. Then in the morning when the sun starts to come, it's time for him to go back to the river. But he discovers with his big stomach that it's too far to go to the river. I would rather go to Gordon's pipe that flows out of his shower. So he now goes to the pipe that flows out of my shower and he backs up in that pipe. Now imagine the frog in the pipe using it as a megaphone. Because even a frog can't keep that to himself. Come to the frog hotel. So here all his buddies start coming, and they start backing up into the pipe. The next day, I go to take my shower, and the water starts coming up in the shower. And I'm like, oh, frogs. I found out. You boil water. No frogs were harmed in the course of this experiment. (laughs) But it was funny. (laughs) You boil water. You've heard that, haven't you? Put a frog in cold water and then begin to boil it. He'll sit there till he's boiled to death. Boil the water, throw him in there, he'll hop straight out. All right, so I pour the boiling water down my shower, and I run outside to where the exit pipe is, and I start watching. When that hot water hits frog number one, he boots frog number two. Wham! And this chain reaction starts until the last frog in the pipe goes... Out the pipe, next one goes, and I'm standing there. It's, it's so much. One time, uh, one of our missionaries said, Well, Brother Gordon, why don't you just like put a screen on the pipe? And I said, Where's the fun in that? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, see, that's exactly what happens in the pipe of your spiritual heart. When unconfessed sin is allowed to reside in your life and you don't deal with it, Satan is perfectly happy to cover that over in your heart and leave it alone. Why? Because he knows. You can't just tell one lie. You tell a lie, another one's coming to cover it up. You know, when you tell the truth, you can go to sleep and forget about it. But if you tell a lie, you can never forget what you said. You better say the same thing next time. And when that lie is not dealt with, it's covered over in my heart, it's going to call for backup. And almost every sin of action has that same pattern until finally one day we find this old branch is fruitless. And what does our good father do? Never never confuse The patience of God with tolerance. God doesn't tolerate sin. The only reason he hasn't exposed it, the only reason he hasn't dealt with it and judged it in your life is he's being patient to give you time to repent and confess. And brothers and sisters, when we get into the throne room of heaven and say, God, search me, try me, see if there's anything in me, lead me in the way everlasting, the Holy Spirit is so sensitive to reveal to us anything that may be hindering the fruit bearing of our branch. Why? Because how is God greatly glorified by we bearing much fruit?
The vine dresser isn't there to harm us. He's not there to hurt us. The vine dresser is there to coax the best fruit out of that branch that's possible. And that's the action of pruning. When I'm working with God and he sees some fruit in my life, he begins to prune me so that I can bear more fruit. You see, when a branch, a natural grapevine, its branches love leaves. Look at this next picture. A natural grapevine just loves leaves. But if all it produces is leaves, there'll be no fruit. And you see on this trellis, look at the fruit that's being born uh, off the branches of this grapevine. How did that happen? Because the vine dresser regularly trimmed or pruned the excess branch leaves that those grapevines love to produce. It can look green and lush, but the purpose of a grapevine is not to produce green leaves. The purpose of a grapevine is to produce grapes. So the vine dresser is carefully cutting and pruning and bringing order to that branch so that it bears more fruit. But then here comes the time when this branch really begins to bear some good fruit. So how do we go from uh, some fruit to more fruit? Well, friends, the older that vine gets, the more tendency is there for it to grow weak unless the vine dresser does some tough pruning, some hard pruning, not to wound the branch, but to enable the branch to bear better, sweeter, more grapes. And friends, this gets into an area that's very difficult for us sometimes because when God begins to deal with us with advanced pruning, he may cut things out of your life that you actually like. They're good. But he's not looking for good. He's looking for best. And he'll check your activities and he'll look at what you're spending your time with and he'll say, you know what? If I could cut some of that uh, excess time that you're using in this area here to do this here, and I could put it on something else, your life would bear more fruit. Did you know that you can't grow without change? You don't change, you don't grow. But in order to grow, I have to change. But friends, when I change, generally it means I have to get rid of some things in my life. I have to adjust some things in my life in order to grow. And friends, when I have to adjust and I have to leave some things that I like doing, it causes pain. I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. I mean, those things bring me some sense of pleasure. But because I want to grow and be more of God's best, I'm willing to adjust and grow. But don't ever believe for a second that it's easy. It can bring grief. But friends, without change, you know what happens? We stagnate. Guess what? Stagnant things smell bad. <laughs> but without change, there's no growth. And the Holy Spirit in us, he's shaping us, molding us, making us more into the image of Christ every day. And the best thing for us to do is to climb up on that trellis and say, Spirit of God, whatever you want to do in my life to adjust my life so that I can bring forth much fruit, here I am, have at it. Now, the, uh, the truth is, because he so wants good fruit in our lives. He's going to do what it takes to get that good fruit. With our cooperation or without our cooperation. And I promise you, with our cooperation is a lot better. This is not pass-fail. You know, in, in school, a lot of exams are pass-fail. No, no, no. In the vineyard of God's work, it's not pass-fail. God puts you into a test 
to design and grow you more into his image so that your life can produce more fruit and you fail, guess what? He said, let's try that again. (laughs) Why? Is this because he's mean? Is it because he's just harsh? Is it because he's just a bad master? No. It's because he loves us so much, he wants our life to bear much fruit for the sake of his kingdom. And eventually, this vine is going to learn, how do I abide in the vine? You see, abiding, it's like an artesian well. We become so accustomed to walking in the presence of God that it requires no effort to live in his presence. We understand that there is a relationship with him. He is our heavenly father. The Lord Jesus is our Savior, our Lord, and our elder brother. And the Holy Spirit is sent to dwell in us, to empower us so that we can obey and follow the will of God. And when I learn to walk in his presence in relationship with him, in unbroken fellowship with him, then, friends, we become like an artesian well. The Scripture says, out of your innermost being will run rivers of water that will never run dry. At the great feast after the Passover, and Jesus stood in front of the crowds that had been feasting all week long. And you know what he said? He said, are you still thirsty? He said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me. Let him drink of the water I'll give him, and he'll never thirst again. And so, friends, look at this last picture. Here's what we're going for. Oh, to be a fruitful vine, for our lives to be adorned with the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of good works. Why? So that people may see your life and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I don't know about you, but old Gordon Ford, boy, I would like to know that my life brings honor and glory to my good father. I owe him everything. All I have, everything that I think is mine (laughs) has come from his throne. Every good and perfect gift comes from our Father. And oh, brothers and sisters, I know in your heart, when you think about your good Father, and one day stepping into the throne room of heaven, have you not ever said, God, if I could just hear those words, what? Well done, Good and faithful servant. Does that describe your heart today? Then get into this garden. Get up on that trellis as a branch. Ask your Savior, Jesus, would you just take a walk into the garden of my heart? Would you just let me see a picture? Underneath my life, there's a bucket to collect the fruit from my life. And as I'm on this branch and I'm looking at the fruit and you're looking at it, Lord Jesus, what do you see in your bucket? Do you see no fruit? Do you see some fruit? Do you see more fruit? And oh, Jesus, boy, I pray one day I would bear much fruit. The picture in the Old Testament of much fruit, you remember the the spies when they came out of the promised land, the 12 spies? Do you remember that they came out with some clusters of grapes to illustrate how fruitful that promised land was? Do you remember how it's described? It says the cluster of grapes was so large, it took two men 
to carry it on a pole. Oh, that we would bear much fruit. Let's pray together. Just a personal moment between you and our Father. For you, just invite the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, lives in us, who is in you as a follower of Christ. He's the, the seal of your salvation. He's your guarantee that you're a child of God. And in your heart this morning, as you've heard this message, I pray that just in your own heart, you would just say, oh, Lord, let me just see where I am on this trellis. Let me just take a look in my life. Show me a picture of how I'm doing and then, Lord, what, what do you want to do in order for me to be a better fruit-bearing branch? Because I want the fruit of my life to be the best it can be. Friends, this isn't a competition with anyone else in the kingdom. We're not, we're not competing with other brothers and sisters. We're just, we're just asking God to bear the fruit in our life that would best bring him honor and glory. That he would be pleased. That our life would put a smile on his face and joy in his heart. Why? Because you are living out what he intended you to be. How he made you to be. When we live out the purpose of his plan, friends, your life is filled with joy. It doesn't mean that there's not challenges and valleys to walk through and mountains to climb, rivers to cross, hardships to deal with. But in the center of your being is a sense of well-being. It is well with my soul. So, Father today by the working of your Holy Spirit who comes to bring all truth to our minds and hearts would you take this word and just teach us what you want us to understand may we just climb up on that trellis of the grapevine affixed to it with an unbroken flow between ourselves and our Savior because of the working of your Spirit in us. Fill us that we may bring you honor and glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So friends, this morning uh, we're going to have a baptismal service and... Um, Chad is going to be leading us through that. We have a couple of people who will be baptized this morning. After the baptismal service is over, we'll uh, close out our service, and Sister Rebecca will be bringing us our announcements. So uh, let's just uh, watch as Brother Chad uh, takes us through the baptismal service. Chad? Thank you. Well, that was wonderful, Gordon. Thank you for that. Uh, it's a great reminder uh, for all of us that if we're, if we're not abiding in Jesus, we, we are detached from life. And it's so wonderful that this morning we have uh, Trevor Lampman, and in a minute we'll have Bunny Pinkston come out. And uh, this, this dear brother and sister have, uh, they've connected to the vine. And they, they have found life. And now this morning they are wanting to tell everybody that. 
which I, that is the absolute best response to what God has done in your life is to want to go tell everybody, right? So please uh, stand this morning as we, as we witness Trevor and Bunny being baptized. Trevor, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Absolutely. And are you ready to tell everybody in this room and online and on TV that you have done that? Without a doubt. Yes, sir. Well, then I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, and raised to walk in the newness of life. stairs back here. <laughs> All right. Bunny and I, uh, we've, we've gotten to talk a little bit, and it's, it's amazing how much the Lord's done in your life. And the songs this morning were just perfect. Spot on. Yeah, speaking of the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. And um, I think Gordon already preached today, so I'll stop. But if we, if we were to tell all the stories of how God has blessed Bunny and taken care of her and saved her, not only her soul, but your, your physical body, yeah, your life, her physical body, the amount of times he's done that, uh, it would be a powerful service, but we'd be here another hour. So <laughs> we can, uh, let's just go ahead and get you baptized. Okay. Huh? Yeah. So Bunny, Bunny has recently rededicated and has just felt this. Uh, this desire to once again tell everybody that she is a follower of Christ and to proclaim his goodness in her life. So, Bunny, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Amen. And are you ready to tell everybody in this room yes, and online I am. and on TV? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's ready. Yes is the answer. Okay. Well, then I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death. Raised to walk in the newness of life. Thank you, Chad. Oh, isn't that good? Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Amen, amen. All right, Sister Rebecca is going to be sharing uh, some announcements with us before we go. You might want to say happy birthday to little one-year-old Psalm. Yesterday was Psalm's birthday. Emily's trying out some new skills. Where's she at? She's carrying camera. Ah, she is back there, Emily. Emily and Chad, congratulations on that beautiful baby girl. Saturday mornings, we have a prayer meeting here that takes place uh, in our church at 8 in the morning. There's a group that gathers. It's been faithfully gathering since, I think, October last year or something like that. So if you'd like to join them, you feel free to do that. Otherwise, Sister Rebecca, you uh, close us out with announcements. Happy Father's Day to all of our faithful dads. Yes, give it up for dads. We need you, we love you, and we respect you. Thank you so much. Dads, take care of yourself. There is a special ministry here called Men to Men. It meets Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. in room 105. Please avail yourself of that wonderful ministry. Thank you for joining us today. If you're a guest, we would love to meet you. We're so glad that you're here. We have a gift for you, so please come talk to us at the Welcome Center. Grove family, we want you to get connected and find a place. Hey. Ooh. Ooh, hello. That's not <laughs> a place to find community. Community is so important. If you don't have a life group, um, ask us at the Welcome Desk about how you can get connected to one. Uh, remember, youth group is happening tonight, but it will not be happening next week because VBS. We're having VBS next week. Woohoo! 
It will happen from the 23rd to the 27th. It'll start at 6.15 p.m. and will go until 8.30. Um, if you are volunteering for VBS, please get your t-shirts out in the atrium today. If you are a student, a child who is signed up to attend, your t-shirts will be next Sunday. Um, remember, Women's Summer Book Club is happening. It's not too late to sign up, ladies. It's not too late. It's going to be super fun. We're all sorts of books and sign-ups for that are on the welcome desk, but also you can look at the QR code, you can boop the QR code, and you can sign up online for that. Um, if you have any questions, you can email womensministry at groveav.com. Please continue to pray for our students on the missions trip this week. And if you haven't received one, if you haven't grabbed one yet, grab a prayer bracelet. It'll have the name of someone who's on the missions trip. Those are also at the welcome desk. And we love and we covet your prayers. Um, now we can say our church verse together. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Have a wonderful week, Grove family.